The videotape will be good. I will miss all of you. Have a great conference. My best to Mindy, Pete, James, and John. Uh, the first time I've missed in 22 years. Cheers, James. Wow. So wow. keep his wife in your thoughts. And with that, I'm going to uh, please please join me in welcoming Mindy Gardner and her fireman Mark and toolmaker Mark. Welcome, Mindy. Thank you, guys. Um, nothing like putting a little pressure on, but <laughs> what can we say? Um, I do use a treadle hammer to do all my chasing and repose work. The reason I do that is um, I really wanted to do blacksmithing, but due to training standard bred racehorses, I had pretty well trashed my arms. And this is a way that I can do my work. So it, it really saves your arms from, you know, hand hammering. Um, I use sheet metal. Sheet metal is ugly. What more can you say about it? It has no character. It has nothing. So the first thing is, do any of you guys know how to texture your sheet metal and make it a little more interesting looking? Uh, that was the first thing we were going to show. Um, let me get my piece of metal. How many of you save scale and hammer it back into the metal? It works really, really well. Maybe Mark can do that, and I can start showing you um, how I do my details so we can try and get as much done as possible. He didn't think he was going to have to work. I <laughs> thought this was a vacation. <laughs> I lied to him. That's an old wives' trick. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, my treadle hammer has a seat on it. I have a, a very high-tech foot rest on it. That. Yeah. <laughs> if you're working like, say, 10 hours a day at it, make it comfortable. Uh, the seat I can take off and move out of the way and it works well. And what I was going to show you is how I put the detail into my work. And I, I guess I do it backwards from the way it's done by a lot of people that do chasing and repose. I put my detail into my work first. I don't use pitch. I use lead and wood. I use lead for working cold. I use the wood if I'm working hot. And what we'll show first is doing fish scales and snake scales. And in your gallery um, are some examples of my work. And I found out a very hard way that on doing snake scales, I'll show you again, that if these lines between each individual scale touch each other, it looks like rectangles all over the snake's bodies. It's horrible. So it's better just to leave it for your imagination to fill in. Yes? Is that better? Like that? Like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what I do is I draw my pattern out on a piece of paper. I use rubber cement to glue it on. I use it as a contact cement. I put it on my metal and also on the back of my paper drawing, wait for it to dry, and put it on. Mark is my tool maker. Mark is an excellent blacksmith. He's an excellent tool maker. Um, this kind of works out. I do his design work, and he makes my tools. We have job security that way. So there's a number of ways you can do your scales. You can do them just as a suggestion and have them spaced out all over a fish. You can do smaller ones 
And you can also rotate your chisel. And I have a curved chisel to do the, the scales and make circles. The other thing is, is trying, when you're doing this, keep your tool straight up and down. And if anybody has any questions, please ask. Uh, are you using just ordinary mild steel, or are you trying to get very low carbon mild steel? I just use plain mild steel. What I do is I bring it up to a high forging temperature three times, let it air cool in between. If I'm using like 14, 12 gauge, um, I'll stick it, you know, underneath my forge and just let it really slowly cool. And this is nothing special. The other way you can do it is have your scales touching each other so you cover like a whole fish. And there's, you know, if, if one gets a little bit off, don't worry about it. It still works out okay. On the snake scales, I'll use a chisel as my first step. And those touched, which wasn't good. When you're, when you're scaling your metal, if you keep one side down to the fire all the time, you'll get a very fine scale pattern. The side that is up and away from the fire, you get a larger scale pattern. So you, depending on what you're making, you can kind of determine what kind of scale pattern you want as a background for your work. Um, on a lot of my work, I flip it both ways and, and get kind of a combination of scale pattern. And the other thing, I've had, I've had students tell me they can't do this kind of work because they can't draw. You guys learned how to write. So kind of my opinion, you can learn the hand-eye coordination to draw if you practice and don't get intimidated by the idea of doing it. At this point, I'm going to rip the paper off. Rub all the rubber cement off. Um, my tools are made of S7 tool steel, and like I say, Mark makes all my tools, and he's an excellent tool maker. 
So this is what I have so far. Then I'll use my first pass butcher, which is This is a first pass butcher. You can see the radius, and it's got a very sharp face to it, so it kind of cuts into the metal and pushes the metal back from what I'm hitting. Um, when you're doing more complex projects, always make sure you have your butcher face the right way, because if you don't, you kind of messed up on something pretty badly that's pretty hard to correct. With the chisel lines in here, I can, it'll just catch right there. It's kind of like, you know, the back cutting thing on doing woodworking. It'll catch there. And The don't tread on me snake in the gallery, that was the only project that I had to do twice. And that's how I found out you don't let things touch. Because I got to a point and I realized, gosh, the scales look like nothing but a rectangle. For just doing the chisel lines to, to outline my drawings, I'll leave the paper on. When I'm done with that, most of the time I'll pull the paper off. Unless it's a really complex design, I'll leave the paper on and pull it off um, as I'm going so I can remember which way my, my butcher is supposed to face. And I did bring... Um, uh, a handout, it's on a CD, and it, it explains doing all that. So you guys can have that and do whatever you want with it. But on, on um, Some of my drawings, what I'll do is I'll actually shade it where I want the heel of the butcher to go. Okay, and so there you have your snake scales. Pardon? Right here. Okay, I'm gonna pass it around. This is a butcher. butcher, like in a meat butcher. Yeah, like in a meat butcher, I guess because it could really butcher the metal. The other thing on this, it's really, and I'll show you, it's really important to hold this tool straight up and down. Because if you don't, if you hold it like this and move it, Let me pass that around and show you. You get horrible, horrible tool marks. And they're almost impossible to get rid of. So what, what you're striving for is a really nice, clean, crisp, sharp line. Looks like you keep the tool on the metal. As yes. As I work, for the most part, I keep it right there. I rock it back just a little bit and pull it forward. When I'm doing this, I'm only moving this tool probably about, oh, a third to a half of the width of the face of the tool every single time I hit, because that'll give you a nice smooth line. Was this piece pre-textured? 
Yeah. What I did is, because there's not a whole lot of time, I tried to get a lot of the pretexturing and the annealing done at home before we came. Because otherwise... And we're seeing the process. Yeah, you're seeing the pro Mark's doing that process. And whenever he's done, he can pass that around. Uh, <laughs> that's one thing I noticed when, when you're teaching somewhere like at Campbell, and people want you to, here, look at my work. And you go to hold on to their tongs. Half of them have left those tongs in the fire. And they're really hot, so I don't touch anything anymore. Let's see. We're going to do hair patterns. Um, I've done dogs and, and other animals. And I brought some books with me. They're under that table that you guys can look at later on. Um, one is, I think, the Atlas of Animal Anatomy for Artists. And it has all the skeletal, muscle, blood vessels, and hair patterns for your more common animals. And if you're doing something, it really helps to study what you're doing before you start doing it. Because then you can kind of determine, you know, how, how much detail do I want to put in, or what can I leave out? Um, if, if you'll notice, this chisel has some rather sharp edges. And I use this one a lot for making feathers. But most of my chisels have a very flat spot in the middle and are very slightly rounded on the edge here. Um, if you have too much of a radius here, when you're moving your chisel across your work, it'll slide right back into the hole that you've made. So make sure you have a good flat spot in there, in the center of it. It's kind of almost, even Mark can talk to you about this while I'm doing some of this. Your tool is almost a little bit canoe-shaped. And if you look at it, I don't know, if, can you get that? How much of that, the face of that tool is touching? Pretty much all of it on this one. But if you have pretty much of a radius, you're hardly touching your metal at all. So hair patterns. So, pardon? Okay, um, hair patterns, your line can be far apart or they can be closer together. The closer together that your lines are, the darker it's going to appear. If I want to make a curve, I'll do what I told you not to do and I'll kind of tilt my tool a little bit so just the edge of it is touching. When you do that, don't hit real hard because your tool will kick out and leave the area. And all of this, you can raise this metal and you're not going to lose your detail. I also have some smaller chisels that I do this with. Here's a small one. I have it wrapped. Oh, this one isn't wrapped. Some of them I'll wrap with vet wrap, and then the things that you can get for putting over a pencil to make it wider, I'll put that on these tiny tools because it really saves your hands. If you, if you hold on to a tool like this all day long, you're going to end up with carpal tunnel. And you can actually sort of make a curve with this straight tool. When you have a treadle hammer, 
Now you're putting your hand under it. Make sure you have some safety device. Um, don't think that a piece of wood under the treadle is going to work because there's enough vibration, it'll move out from under there. I'm gonna not do every single piece of hair here. We'll just get the idea of it. How many of you know what hatching and cross hatching are? <laughs> okay, two of you. Uh, you can use that for doing your, your um, chasing. The other thing is, is this hammerhead weighs 65 plus pounds, so you don't have to use that much force. Um, a biggest problem we have when, when teaching is so many people think, I have to hit this really, really hard, and you really, really don't. And it's better to go back over your design a couple times than to hit really hard just once. On this, I don't remember. I think I think this is 16. If you make longer hair, just make a, a longer line. Yes. Yep. This is actually Mark's treadle hammer. Mine is bolted to the floor. Mine doesn't go anywhere. And the one I have, uh, we went and watched a demo by, by George Dixon and thought, wow, the treadle hammer really looks cool. So Mark went home and, and built one. And the one I have um, is the same type configuration and everything but it's more the junkyard metal that got used for different parts. Mark can explain that to you. Um, he used what he had, and it was the, the only one we had, and it was on his side of the shop. And I don't know how it happened, but it's I, I, after George's demo and Mark building a, a treadle hammer, I thought, wow, this is a way I can do some blacksmithing. And we went home and tried to do it, and what I made was, it was horrible. And, you know, it got pitched, in, and I went back to wood carving. And then in 99, we got our blacksmith shop, and Mark's going to kill me when I say this, but... The, the group project or a project for a trade item for IVBA was a leaf. Belt buckle is what Mark made. And the veins on the leaf were kind of jaggedy. And I just thought, I'm going to see if... <laughs> I kind of thought, I'm going to go home and see if I can do that and make a straight line. So. I, it, that was in 99 is when I really started doing this. And I worked 10 to 12 hours a day standing at the treadle hammer teaching myself how to do this. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a good thing to do. Um, figure out a project if you want to learn how to do this or learn tool control where you have to make a lot of straight lines and then maybe take a picture of them with your cell phone and enlarge it, and you can really tell how you're doing. A 
Okay, so now you can kind of see how you do the longer hair. Um, little tiny short hair, I'll just use the corner of this tool and just do it very close together. And this, this is almost like I make a feather. And it goes relatively quickly. It's just boring. Um, lines closer together to make an area look darker. And that, this is all like your hatching marks for shading on drawings. So a lot of the things that I'm doing are the same as drawing on paper. This is like drawing on a piece of metal. And from what I understand, you guys have an art teacher whose husband and maybe her are members. And I bet she could do a demo in drawing for you sometime for those that are intimidated by it. And when you think back, think about the fact that before you could write, what did you do? You did a lot of drawings, right, as a kid? Crayons, drawings, right? I don't remember. <laughs> But I think what happens is, is people get older, maybe they get afraid of what people are going to think of what they're making and they're drawing, and then they quit doing it. So don't let the idea of what somebody else thinks of what you're doing intimidate you or make you not do it. And even when you're, you're doing your blacksmithing, you kind of have to draw out your design, don't you? I mean, it's in your head. How do you get it onto metal or made out of metal? Sometimes I just have to beat the metal and <laughs> into submission. <laughs> um, and afterwards, I can draw a plan of what I did. <laughs> a lot of times, I don't know what it is I'm going to do until, <laughs> until you do it. Oh, does this sound familiar? Use a bigger tool, make this go faster. But actually drawing, drawing is, is not that bad. It's, it's just get some self-confidence and don't worry about what the guy next to you is going to think about what you're doing. Yeah, I can do that, or while I'm doing this, Mark can even talk to you about that. I'm Honey, you can do two things at once. <laughs> he doesn't have a microphone? Okay. Um, what we use is, is pure lead. You can buy it. You can find somebody who does restoration work on stained glass. Um, if, you, if you find that, you're going to have to burn out all the other stuff that they use, like the caulking and stuff. So do it in a real well-ventilated area. We, Mark made a little like muffin pan to put the lead in. He melts it. And he pours it, and let me get a piece of it. Does uh, lead uh, tire weights work, or is that wrong? They're too hard. 
It has to be pure lead. Let's see. This is the same size as my anvil. So when I'm using my lead, that just fits on there perfectly. But yeah, don't, don't use anything except for pure lead. And after it's, it's all totally mashed up, um, it gets remelted and, and reformed. The other thing is, is okay, so I've just handled lead so I don't go licking my fingers. Um, we were demonstrating at the State Fair in Illinois, and I had this man approach me, and he said, what kind of metal is that? So I said, well, this is mild steel. And I said, no, no. And I said, well, this is mild steel. And he said, no, that's stuff in between. And I said, it's lead. He turned out to be from the EPA. And this man totally hassled me about having lead. And I said, well, you know, I don't put hot metal on it. If it has any white oxide on it, I don't use it because that white oxide will go airborne when you hit it. So remelt it. Um, I said, you know, if I'm doing something hot, because this guy was just really getting under my skin at that point, if I'm doing something hot, I use a piece of wood and it makes smoke and flames and impresses people like you. <laughs> um, <laughs> the next guy to come visit me was a state fire marshal. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a one-two punch, one right after the other. And I, I think they had it set up. And he said, you know what people like you die from? I said, no, what am I, what am I going to die from? Being damaged from dealing with people like you? <laughs> Pretty much. And he said, people like you die from emphysema. And I said, well, you know, I'm old already, so I don't think it's going to catch up with me. <laughs> Then I had to go tell the director of the Illinois Artisans Program that I had just insulted two state officials. And their comment was, is what you should have said to them is, why don't you go lick some lead in the ghetto and be done with it? I mean, they, they were totally on my side with it. And they also ha just hassled the glass blowers for having fire at the state fair and you know, for what they were doing. Um, these guys were pretty obnoxious. You can see how I'm turning this tool. I'm kind of using the edge of it to make sort of a, a curve. And you can actually, with a little chisel, you can make a circle and not have horrible marks. I think McMaster sells lead, don't they, Mark? Yeah. Who does? Roofing supplies. Roofing supplies? Okay. Does the lead of the stained glass people use? Is that the people? Oh, yeah. So just don't go breaking church windows to get your lead. But if you, but if uh, that, that might be oh real way. Uh, if you can find where they're tearing down old houses and you've got the, the old cast iron hub plumbing, the lead that they poured in that was usually pure. Yeah, just make sure you use pure lead because the other stuff is too hard. Yeah, you could get it out of there. And, and the big thing with, with lead, um, the doctor I go to came to our shop to see what we do. And I was showing him, and he said, what's that? And I said, it's lead. And he said, OK, then you get a lead test just like the little kids do. 
So, you know, every time I get a blood test, they do a lead test. And I think I probably got more lead contamination from my little lead soldiers and stuff that I used to play with. Okay, here's what we have so far. So if you're doing an animal, this is how you can do your, your hair patterns. Um, I think on this same piece of metal, I can show you some hatching and cross hatching. Oops. Yep. Do you want me to pass them around real quick? Just do it quick, because then we'll get on to the the next thing. Do you have lots of shapes, or half circles? Um, I don't have a whole lot. What I did is when I started, I just had seven basic tools, and I think for about four years, I only used those tools. And it was probably a really good thing, because I really learned how to make those tools work for me, rather than me working to make more tools or saying, hey, Mark, make this for me, make this. Um, I think what happens a lot with people that do this kind of work or do blacksmithing is a lot of people keep making different tools for everything they're going to do. And kind of when, when we teach, I tell people, learn, learn to use those seven basic tools and use them well then make different tools. Let's see, I have another chisel I can use. Also, the other thing to point out, when you're making your tools, this tool is absolutely beautiful. It's all nice, shiny, polished, a little bit rectangular going through here. This tool is very hard to use because it's slippery. Also, this rectangular part, when I'm using my tool, I roll it in my fingers to get it to go different directions. This doesn't work that well. This tool that is totally ugly is much easier to use. My hand doesn't slide on it. It's got some tooth on it to turn it. Look at how easy that is in comparison to this other tool. Anyhow, to do hatching, hatching is just a bunch of lines right next to each other. You can use that for shadowing places. Cross hatching. And if you look at old, like, Leonardo da Vinci drawings, he used a lot of hatching and cross-hatching. So if, if you get old art books and look at them, you can really learn a lot about how they did their, their shading using lines. Okay, for my cross-hatching, I'm just going to go across like this. This is kind of hard to see because it's not sanded off, but. Okay. Pardon? Um, the cross hatching, let's see, doo -doo, doo -doo, is right there. Yeah, it, it's not showing. There, that's working. OK, this is confusing because it's backwards from what I'm doing. There is the, cro the cross hatching is up here. And you can see, even, even with the scale still on, you can see the difference in the darkness. OK? Like that? 
Okay. And where are the tools? Thank you. Feathers. How many of you have made feathers? Just, just a few of you. OK. Um, have you made feathers on sheet metal? Like if you're making a whole bird? Make a whole bird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did that. It's in the gallery. If somebody wants to get it and just hold the edges and bring it over, we could use that as an example and he could film it. Okay, cool. Um, I, I got this idea one day to make a whole bird and the way it came about and I was kind of disgusted with the politics in this country at the time. And it says remain free USA. And I decided that making an eagle holding the banner would be a, you know, turn out kind of cool. So I got a book about feathers and eagles and how many tail feathers there are and primary flight feathers. And there's the right number on that eagle. It, it's pretty detailed. But it was like making all these feathers. What a nightmare. You know what I did is when we were doing public demonstrations is I would take that piece and work on it. So I didn't work on it all at one time because I'm not going to sell that one. I'm keeping that. Um, Plus you probably go crazy working straight. Oh, you, I'd have been cross-eyed if I'd have done that. So I just would work on it a little bit. And, and the interesting thing is it got people thinking about all the rights that we're losing and what's happening. And people would start talking about, well, that's not right. You know, that shouldn't be happening. So it was, it was kind of done as a political statement. <laughs> it worked. Which, it, it did work. Okay, I don't know if you can get that. Oh. I'll tell you what, can I come closer to you? Okay. There are 13 stars for the 13 colonies. So I was really hoping that, that people would understand the meaning of it. So anyway, um, I guess, do you want to hold it and they can look at it? If you just hold it on the edges. Um, it's got an oil and renaissance wax finish on it. It's hand sanded, but I didn't sand much on the eagle. Where I wanted it to appear dark, I used the scale as my coloring. So there are a number of ways to make feathers. You can sort of like the fish scales. Make the suggestions. I can find where I threw my tools. Uh -oh. did, you, did you freehand draw this eagle before you yep. started? Um, all the drawings I do, I do freehand. Uh, I think I've, we were talking about this last night. I probably would have been the poster child for Ritalin because all I did in school was drawings. And um, nobody said anything about it. It's just like, really? OK, to suggest feathers. And there are some of these just suggested on that bird. Just use your curved chisel. Use a small chisel. And go through here and kind of fan out some, some delicate lines in here.
So this, this is just a suggestion of feathers, this little top piece. Here's another suggestion. It's more or less similar to the fish scales. I'll make a line at the bottom of what's going to be my feather. I think it was in 2002 I got invited by the um, Illinois art, well, actually, I guess it was by the governor's wife at the time um, to make an ornament for the White House Christmas tree. And I did a bird, I did a indigo bunting. It had to be a bird that was indigenous to the state that you resided in. So an indigo bunting came into our backyard, and I thought, cool. I can make an indigo bunting. I can use all the tempering colors to color the piece. So it was indigo bunting on a purple cone flower. Um, and there's a yellow cone flower. And the bird was blue. So you can, you can do that coloring on one piece. Um, there's another suggestion. Watch the monitor. I know I am, but that's confusing me. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think the light's playing with you, but if I don't have it, I can't really see what I'm doing. Uh, the other way you can do it is just make a, a fine line like for the, the shaft of the feather down the middle. And I used all these different methods on that eagle. And then just go around here. Somebody told me you can use this method for making files. And the harder thing is, is doing the mirror image of it. Have you done Damascene? No, I haven't. But I heard this would work very well for it. That's what I thought was shown to do. Yep. It was this cross hatching. The cross hatching, and then what you take a softer piece of metal and you can pound it into it. Yeah. Like a piece of, of brass or silver or, or gold or, or gold. copper. Or, yeah. It's, it's the same thing. But no, I, I haven't done that. I've wanted to try doing it. You're, you're the hard part there. Pardon? You, you're the hard part there. The hard part there, yeah, I just haven't done the pounding part. Yeah. Yeah, Tom Latine was telling me about that. And it sounds like something really cool to do. Have you done it? No. No? Okay. And this part, once you kind of get the rhythm to it, it's really very simple to do. And with the paper still on it, you can kind of see what's happened. OK. This other one is kind of the same thing, except I have a chisel line to the outside of it. But so I made my ornament for the White House back to that. And you get invited to a brunch at the White House. It's like, oh, cool. So we got invited to this brunch, and I could bring anybody I wanted to bring with me. So you know who it was. Um, but, but you had to call him an RSVP with his date of birth, social security number, you know, everything imaginable. 
So they're making small talk. You, you call there and it was, you know, White House, Mrs. Bush's office, January speaking. And January was very nice. And she's making small talk and she said, how are you going to get here? And I said, well, transmission just went out on my pickup truck. So if I can't rent a car, I'm probably going to have to hitchhike. <laughs> I just said that goofing around. She said, well, um, that's not a good idea. And she gave me a, probably a 10, 15 minute lecture on the dangers of hitchhiking. <laughs> Oh, man, you know, what, what have I done? So they send Air Force London. Yeah, right. And then she said, um, we're not supposed to tell you where to go and not to go in Washington, but I think I'm going to tell you. I'm going, oh, no. What a goof up. I guess you just don't joke with them at all. They take everything seriously. So what I'm doing on this one is I've used the chisel to the outside and kind of outlined this feather and then put all those little lines in. On the, and it's really hard to see. The, the level at which you're hitting this, you're not expanding that metal really at all. You, nothing grows. Or oh, it does grow. Does it? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, um, on some of the things that I'm doing, and we do it as a team project a lot, getting it back flat, because it warps so much. Does it, does it expand in diameter? Not really in diameter. Well, does it or not? It must a little bit. Probably a few thousand or something. But, not but it turns into a nice bowl shape. So it's getting, getting things back to flat is, uh, is a nightmare. Um, swear a lot. <laughs> um, that's why I have to be really careful what I'm saying in a group like this, because I'm in the shop by myself all day, and <laughs> only the dogs hear me. <laughs> so um, you have to learn how to stretch it and shrink it. And it's a lot of experimenting. It's, uh, do it both. Some of it with heat, some of it cold. Um, the interesting thing is, is like just doing stuff like this, where I'm not raising anything, it's harder to get it back flat. It's very, very hard. Have you ever used heat and water and just shrink it back? I haven't used any water. But you might try. might try it because it is absolutely, and especially like with the Eagle, that's 12 gauge. And think about this. You can't hit where your design is. You have to work on the outside of that. Um, occasionally, if I do hit, like on something where I have a design, I'll use a business card. And I'll cover my design with a business card. And you can hit over it very carefully. Business card, all the paper sinks into where your lines are and protects it. So when everybody gives you a business card that you really don't want, <laughs> you can. Immortalized, didn't they? Yeah. They, they just have no idea what's happening to it. That are a lot of times, unfortunately, they go through the washing machine. But another way is just very vaguely um, suggest, let's see, I don't like this, <laughs> suggest your feathers um, on this, with this right here. It's really just using lines to make a suggestion of where the feathers are. And I brought a scrapbook, and I can put that out later on. You can look at it. When you're working with paper in between your tool and your metal, you have to hit just slightly harder because the paper works as a cushion.
many of you went to Colorado to the Abana conference and looked at, at the Mexican um, silver work? And it's, if, if you've never seen it, it's worth it just to go see them and what they do. But, you know, I was kind of amazed. It's like, wow, they're doing feathers the same way I do. So it's kind of interesting. I'll do this next one. It's sort of the same thing. There, there are two things never, nobody ever tells you about doing this work. Is when we went home after watching that demo, and there wasn't really, he didn't demonstrate much of this kind of work. Um, but there's a lot of yelling stuff sitting there that you just looked at and go, wow, is that cool? Um, when you scale your metal, get it ready to work with, such as this. I can't tell your small scale pattern from your large. Yeah. OK, I believe this is his, his large. But when you heat this metal at all, it warps. And it warps badly. Before you start working, you have to get it back to flat, dead flat. I have a, a huge light table. And that's where I test everything, is on that glass light table. Um, a lot of prim printing companies are going out of business. And you can get fabulous light tables for free just to get them out of their buildings. The one we got is what, probably three and a half foot or more by four and a half foot. And this guy worked for a printing company. And he thought he'd take it home, but he couldn't get it into his house. I was like, oh, gee, what a shame. He said, Is it, do you want it? And I said, yeah. He said, could I use it? And I said, well, yeah. But then I found out he wanted to use it for cutting mats. And they'd obviously been cutting on it. So I went to a paper that was closing and got him a small light table that would fit in his house. He's happy. I'm happy. He's not cutting on this glass anymore. OK, this feather I am outlining with um, my chisels. And I'm also going to show part of the shaft of this feather. Now, maybe you're fixed with the eagle on it. It's a fairly large diameter. Yeah. It's not going to seat neatly on the anvil of a treadle hammer. No, you got to hold it. OK. Are you just holding it by hand? I'm holding it by hand. OK. Yeah. No specially holding device to catch We had one thing that I did that it was a tabletop. It was 22 inches in diameter that I did under here. And we did have mounted a thing on the side of both sides of the treadle hammer that came up and would support that piece of work. It worked to a degree. The hard part is, is every time I'm hitting, I'm moving metal, and this thing started cupping. Right. So you're still, it's helping somewhat, but you're still holding it. So, you know, the bigger it is, the more problems you run into. Okay, on this one I outlined it, but I'm going to use my butchers. So I'm going to try and pull the paper off. from around it. And I don't know if you can see this with your camera, but you can see I shaded around this one a little bit. And I don't know how many of you know what a stump is for shading. It's like a, a pencil made out of paper. 
And what you do is you make a real black mark with some, some with your lead pencil. You rub this on it. And then you can use your stump and make shadows. And I use that a lot kind of as my road map for doing this kind of work. It's kind of like a, a dirty eraser. A what? A dirty eraser that just smears the, uh, the charcoal rather than... Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. Is that something you buy at Stump? Yep. You can, you can buy it in an art store. Um, I also brought a, a Dick Blick catalog. And Dick Blick is a really cool art store. And they ship really quickly. Um, that's where I get a lot of my art stuff. But you could get it if you have a Hobby Lobby or a Michaels or something like that close to you, you can get them there. OK, here is, I'm going to use my first pass butcher, which is steeper and my second pass. You can kind of see the difference between them when I hold them face to face. The first pass will cut in. It will push the metal back slightly. Second pass has a sharp face also that will flatten the metal some more. That's what you're using as a stump? No, this is what I'm using right now to go around the outside of the feathers that I'm going to make now. It kind of raises the feather up. It, ra it, it, it makes it, it doesn't really raise it. It gives the illusion yeah. of its raise because a lot of this work is. Everything around it is pushed down. Everything around it is pushed down. And a lot of this work is making, creating an illusion. There was a guy that talked about the, the depth of uh, markings in a coin. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you were to measure that, it's only a few thousands. Right. But it looks deep. It looks deep. And then I also, while we're talking about making things look deep, um, this was kind of a, a special tool. And you can see the angle on that. It's very steep. What I do with this tool is after I'm done with the whole project, if I want something to really have a deep shadow line, I'll use this. And I won't use a flatter or a second pass butcher or anything else after it. It just will go along the edge and make a very deep, very sharp line in it. And when you look at it, it, it creates a shadow. It's really cool. You can pass this one around if you want. So when you use that stump, that's just on the paper. That, the stump, the be. yes. It's, my paper is kind of like my road map of where my shading is going to be. I found out that if you, if you do a really like confusing project, if you don't use that road map and you face your butcher the wrong way, it's like, man, I just spent all this time and I've created a piece of junk. And, and <coughs> usually, excuse me, usually you can't make a correction. <coughs> Yeah, please. So I'll use my, my first pass butcher. This one tends to make tool marks. Ah, thank you very much. Tends to make tool marks when I go around a curve. However, when I use my second pass butcher, it'll correct it somewhat. When you're um, totally finished with a project, found out that annealing it one more time, and I'll just won't bring it up to a real high forging temperature. I'll just bring it up to an orange color, let it air cool. It's softened it enough. Lots of times you can go back over it with your second pass butcher or with just a flatter and get rid of any marks that you don't want. Of course, every time you heat it, you're losing a little bit of detail. Um, you're also warping it more. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but I find that it works well. The other thing you can do is I have a, 
oxypropane torch and you can just heat spots of your work. You can see how I'm rocking this tool back a little bit and pulling it toward me and how little I'm moving it every single time. It's also, like I said before, better to go over things a couple of times than do it once really hard. And as far as I'm concerned, anybody wants to come up from the side and look at this, it's okay with me. It's, it's not going to bother me. And that's the line I get with my first pass butcher. Okay. I'll go over it with the second pass butcher. I think I'll leave one with just the first pass and one with the second pass and you guys can see the difference. What material have you made that butcher out of? It's S7. Yeah, Mark makes all my tools. So tool questions, I'll refer to him because he's, he's gotten to be a very, very, very good tool maker. I mean, really good tool maker. <laughs> I also tried using my butchers on stainless. Don't do it. Stainless is hard enough that when you're hitting like this, it'll actually roll the sharp edges up. So. so do you just stay away from stainless altogether, or do you have different tools for stainless? Um, what I do with stainless, and what I've decided to do, is um, I can use my, my chisels on it. For some reason, it doesn't ruin the chisels. I also have a fuller that has got a fairly, fairly sharp edge. You can pass this around, too. And whenever you're done with the tools being passed around, just give them back to me, and I'll put them in the right drawers. Um, it doesn't bother those, but it, it definitely makes a mess out of a butcher. And I made a belt buckle that looked like a ginkgo leaf, and I was like, oh, man, now my tools are all messed up. Okay, so there you have the first pass butcher and the second pass butcher. And you can see the difference in the width of the line. Hey, he can be our, our work holder for you. You can feed him. <laughs> well, why don't we wait till I'm done with it, and then we'll pass it around, and I'll, I'll work on the next one. Um, what you can do after this is you can use your flatter to even out that ridge. I'm not going to do this. I think it would be better just to leave it so you guys can see the difference in what the butchers do. Um, to make my lines, making lines on a feather, you don't want to go up over the shaft because it totally ruins it. And some people have asked me if I make, you know, if they're straight lines from one edge to the other. Absolutely not. It's just random. Um, yeah, I noticed on the eagle that it didn't touch the shaft and it didn't touch the outside edge. It was. Yeah, but your eye fills it in. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, you d definitely don't want to touch the shaft. And also, like I, I say, it's, it's not a straight line. Um, from the shaft to the edge of the, the feather. Can't do it in a gas forge. Good question. For the scale patterns, can it be done in a gas forge? No. Because a gas forge, you get a very even heat, and it doesn't create the scale pattern. It's got to be done in a coal forge. So um, I'm glad you asked that. And this is where people usually have, have problems um, making feathers is they hit too hard. It's just very, very light taps to make a feather. I'm going to hand this off to you, and then you can hold it up for him. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to work. I better take that back and do the rest of my, my feathers, and then I'll give it to you guys for keeps. OK, you can kind of see how this drawing was done with the feathers, with, with the shading, et cetera. It's done essentially the same as this one was. Um, but between every single feather, I have to use my butcher to give the layered looks of the different feathers. Uh, let's see. What I'm using for the ends of the feathers is a curved chisel. And I have different sizes of these. So I've made just those, those little ends with that chisel. And then I'll use my straight chisel to do the rest of the outline. And you can line it. You can feel where that one chisel ended. You can line it up. I usually. When I'm finished with my work, there's, there's a couple ways to get rid of this scale. 
One of it is hand sanding. I'll use 80 grit sandpaper and a red 3M scotch Bright. When you use your scotch Bright, do not go on the cheap and get the generic scotch Bright. Get the 3M. The generic stuff is a lot rougher and it makes horrid scratches in your metal. Um, I spend probably almost as much time doing the finish work as I do making my work. Uh, Yep, everything I do sanding wise or any way to remove scale is by hand. If you use anything mechanical, it's too aggressive and it removes your scale pattern too. So it's a lot of hand work. When you're doing like some of the sanding, I'll take home at night and sit there and watch TV and sand, so I'm not quite as bored <laughs> as I would be otherwise. And change the subject right now, I'm working on the shaft of the feather. I've done the outline of the feather, and now I'm doing the, the shaft of it. I find that it's easier to work pulling the tool toward myself than pushing it away. Oh, thank you. Okay, cool. Well, another thing is doing this kind of work, it's really handy to know where your tools are. And if I put them in a wrong drawer and then I'm looking for a long period of time, it's just like, man, that's ridiculous. Okay, this is what we have so far. Can you see that? It's kind of a mess. So I know on the feathers where my butcher is going to go, so I'm just going to rip the paper off right now. Where? Oh, it's, it's rubber cement. Paper or? Yeah, it's okay. That's that's another good thing. Good question. That's not type paper, is it? It's not typing paper. I use sketchbook paper. Sketchbook paper has some tooth to it. Your tools don't slide as much. On copy paper or tracing paper, your tool just slide on it. So use sketchbook paper for uh, for your patterns. Um, if, like, if you're tracing something, a design, like, I'll do my drawings over and over and over again until I get what I want. Um, I have the light table so I can see through the sketchbook paper. If you don't have a light table, you can do your drawing and you can put it on, tape it on a bright window, tape your sketchbook paper over it, and you can use a bright, you know, the sun. It works. And for adhesive, you just like you use a spray or? No, I don't use a bottled spray. Bottled rubber cement? Bottled rubber cement. The spray I found out, number one, you can't just, it doesn't just rub off. Rubber cement, I just go like that. And I did a, a terrible thing with rubber cement one day. Here, put your hand out. This is bad. What does that look? You dropped it. <laughs> no, don't look for it. We'll get more. What does it look like? It's not. No, after it's black with scale, it looks like mouse poop. 
<laughs> so you can play horrible jokes with your <laughs> leftover rubber cement. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, I put some on a paper plate once and gave it to my stepson and pretended I spilled it on his lap and he just totally <laughs> freaked out. <laughs> Probably not nice, but it was it was comical. Okay, so I have I have my feathers outlined like this. Do you want it closer? Okay, I'm going to use my first and second pass butcher on this. And I'm going to use a flatter a little bit. So I'll start here. To go around a curve, I do tip this just a hair. At home, I have a rubber mat under my treadle hammer, and it absorbs some of the shock. I don't know how many of you have treadle hammers. If you have a concrete floor or something, it really helps to have a mat or a carpet under it. The flatter? OK. This is a flatter, and it, it's got one sharp sharp edge, and the rest of it is flat. It's basically just a set hammer. Oh, yeah. The two okay, this is the butcher. Yeah. So you can see the butcher has the radius. Thank you. You're welcome. This is a first pass butcher. Second pass butcher has a little bit flatter part here. So it's pushing the metal down and back. It's half flat. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Sharp, yeah. half flat, flat. Yeah. Very good way to state it. So, what you, you talked about for the first few years, you used seven basic tools. I had two fullers, a flatter, two butchers, a chisel. Oh, and a ball tool. Ball tool is, oops. It comes with different radiuses also. That's your ball tool. And you can use it for raising things. But when you use one of these, remember, from the back, and this looks like, okay, it's going to raise this whole area. Mm -mm it'll make like a dimple if it's too small. So what I use a lot for raising things, ball-peen hammer. It's, it's a wonderful tool. So go to farm sales and clean them out. And you can see this thing. It's been dressed, no sharp edges, nice radius. You can pass it around, and I use it under my treadle hammer a lot when it's hot, doing hot work. Oh yeah. Yep. No, I'm I'm not hand hammering. I'm this is doing all my work. And if you look at this, the the sides of this describe a sharper, uh, a, a smaller ball. Yep. And the top of that is a much larger. Yeah, it's, it's all been. A, it's not 180 degree. Oh no, it's no, no, no. A lot no. flatter Be on that ball. Because. And I can take a piece and show, show you what happens. Um, let's do that right now with a piece of lead. And I was going to show you guys how to chisel cut things, too. Do you guys do that very often, cut things out with a chisel? It turns out really nice. And you can get, like, the horse head hinge. 
this shows all the different steps from the drawing to cutting it out. All this was cut out with a chisel. And you can see the beveled edge that it makes. That's done cold. It doesn't take that long. OK, like if I'm using these tools to raise something into my lead, we'll just go right on down the line. I was just using lead now. Um, when I'm doing my detail work, I don't use lead. I just use the lead for the raising things. Um, the other thing you can do, and I guess it's not, not your standard operating procedure, is if I'm, if I'm doing something and I want to raise an edge and have a really sharp edge, I'll use my butcher very carefully from the back along the line. Because when you, when you do this work, you can start to see the outline of where that feather is from the back. If I want to raise something, I use that as my guide to where I'm going to raise it. If I want to raise it and have a sharp edge, I'll use my butcher just to the inside of that and do it carefully because you can shear the metal. But like 14 gauge, 12 gauge, it can really have a cool effect. You know, just experiment with it. OK, these are the different marks that I get with the um, different ball tools. And let me show you with the ball peen. With that, if I'm raising a great big area, I'm going to have a hard time getting rid of those scalp icky marks. So this one's a good one to use. This one somebody gave me. I guess it was from the railroad. So just remember, when your ball tool and your radius looks nice and large, on this other side, it's not going not to look that way. Use bigger than what you think you have to. I was, was it 2004, I demonstrated for a banner, And I hadn't done this that long, so I was really terrified. And the interesting thing was is, you know, I was doing these things, but I wasn't thinking about how I did them. So I started making these step boards on how I did things so I could <laughs> remember how it was done. And I never realized, like, making a feather, I think there's 20-some steps to making a feather. I was like, wow, that's horrifying. If you start getting, like, like chopped up tool marks in your work, I always question myself and question if my tool is, if I'm holding it right, if it's straight up and down. Um, you know, I'll, I'll hit and I'll actually look and say, oh, is that tool straight or is it crooked or what am I doing wrong? If it's not you, if it keeps happening, start questioning your tool. To check your tools a lot of times, you can feel if part of it's higher or something's wrong with your tool easier than you can see it. So you know, just close your eyes, use your fingers to feel if there is a high spot. Um, after a period of time, you're always holding this tool oriented the same way. Dragging it, you tend to you know, lose part of the metal here. 
And I have, I have a butcher that is tremendously shorter because it's been dressed so much, but um, it does happen. Your tool does get uneven, so you're going to have to redress it. To check your tool to see if it is right, aluminum is a great thing because it's soft enough and you can see if your tool isn't hitting right or if it's a high spot or low spot. So just get a hunk of aluminum and, and play with it. If you're making a line with your butcher, say if you wanted to end your line, instead of having a, an abrupt stop, what you can do is just start hitting lighter, and you can have a very nice tapered look to your line. It'll come down to a point even. So if, if on some of the things that I make, I don't want to have a sharp, abrupt end, just start hitting softer. And it makes a narrower line. OK, this is the, the first pass butcher. If anybody wants to come up here and look, you can. You're welcome to. OK. So now I'll go around it with the second pass. This is like watching grass grow, sorry. You can see that this, this piece of metal is starting to kind of cup a little bit from hitting it and displacing the metal. You see that at all? There's a couple ways to straighten it. Um, I have a wood swedge block and a rawhide hammer. I'll use that because I don't want to mar my metal when I'm doing this. Um, I can put it on a piece of lead and hit it from the back with a flatter. So something like 18 gauge, that works fine. And 12 gauge doesn't work too well. OK, and this one, to get it back level and get these lines. Right now, these lines are kind of raised up from the back. I want to get it all back level. So I'll just use a piece of lead and a flatter. And I have different sizes of flatters. OK, 
Hey, do you want to hold it up for him? Thank you. What I'll do now is I'll use a flatter and I'll just flatten these ridges just a little bit. It doesn't have to be done too much. And anything that I destroy with this flatter, I can go back in and put the detail back in. Um, yeah, I'm kind of using it as an edge tool in between here yeah. because otherwise it's going to smash the shaft. And right there, I just hit the shaft, but it's no biggie. Okay, so I'm going to have to go in and put some of the lines back in for the shaft. And, you know, it, you know where they are. You can still see them. It's just that they've been kind of smushed a little bit. And just do it, do it rather gently. The other thing is, oops, that one I goofed on. The other thing is, is um, feathers are almost a little bit forgiving, is everything isn't perfectly flat because you're going to put all those other little lines in it. And at home, I have lights coming in from either side, too, because light is your friend for this. I'm trying to feel where that is. No, that's fairly, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time doing this because we'll be here all day. Okay, so then you start making all these lines in here. I'm using a little tiny chisel. Okay, you can come up closer. I won't, I, won't, I won't bite you or anything, I promise. <laughs> oh, that's scary. <laughs> hey, I haven't killed anybody since. <laughs> Since when? 9.30? Where's the body? I'm good. You know they all draw trucks. And you have to line this up just next to that shaft.
first feather I made, it was just a little tiny owl feather, and I was just goofing around making it to see how, you know, how it would be done and coloring it and everything. And I had it in the shop, and this man walked in, and he wanted the feather. I didn't want to sell the feather, so I set a real stupid price, and he bought the feather. <laughs> For a feather this big, he paid $75. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. And it was experimental. <laughs> Evidently, that was really a mess up on my part. But like I've made turkey feathers, and I sold one of those for 700 because they are so labor intensive. You, you know, it's, but evidently, and leaves, I was going to make leaves and make a sculpture of a tree. I never got the tree made because people kept buying the leaves. <laughs> Still haven't made the tree. On, on feathers, the important thing is to kind of lock the tool in your hand at, at an upward angle. Um, most common problem is, is holding the tool out straight. So lock it at an angle, hold it at that angle throughout your whole thing whole process. It is hard on your hands. To get into here, I'm holding it. It's kind of at an angle to follow the angle that my butchers and my flatter have made. But I want to get it as close up to the previous feather as possible. Then we were at Campbell, I demonstrated, you know, after dinner they'll have a demo. So I demonstrated making a feather. And there is this gentleman there and his daughter who were, what, third generation chocolatiers, they called them. They're having a chocolate making class. And they were making chocolate boxes. And she liked the feather, so after the demo, the next morning I gave it to her. So she made me a box of chocolates. <laughs> the whole box was dark chocolate. You could eat the box and the interior. <laughs> it was like, oh, wow, is that good? That's a good trade. Oh, man, it was the best trade. <laughs> I mean, and they were just unbelievable gourmet-type chocolates. Yeah, it was a wonderful trade. And then the next year, they were back again and traded them something for another box of chocolates. I could not take that class because I would eat it and everything before I had anything made. And see how on this very edge, I'm going very, very gently because I don't want to smash that edge that's raised up a little bit. into the other feather. And you can see on this one, the shaft is even closer. So you see the angle I have this tool at? I'm just using the edge of this tool to do this. And then as I get further down, I can level it out some. OK, guys, while I'm doing this, and um, 
don't have anything to say. Why don't you tell us about your group project? Okay, explain that to me. For, for scaling my metal? Yeah. Absolutely has to be done in a coal forge. Okay. You don't have a coal forge? I haven't set it up again. So okay, it's Okay. Yeah, now you have to use you have to use a coal forge. Oops. This is getting hard to see. I'm probably going to quit at this one. About ready to go cross-eyed. I think I'm going to quit there because I'm. This light is not real good, and it's really hard to see. Okay, so. That's what you have. You need it closer? Okay. Yep, you just got one. Feathers are very boring to make, but the effect is really cool. It's, it's you get bored out of your mind doing it. I can see that part. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're horrid to do. We'll be breaking okay. in about five minutes, so we need to get some good stuff before we... We're at one right now, if you want to do it now. Or do you have five more minutes to go? We can... Okay, we can talk about... You can do it now? Let's do it now. Don't forget, uh, Don Hanley.